us as a platform to continue to help support each other and come up with a solution. So let me just see if Sister Amira is ready to join us. She is. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Thank you so much, Shaheen, for inviting me. No problem. And uh, the platform is all yours. Please go ahead. Okay, all right. Well, thank you so much. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, may the peace and blessings of God be upon you all, everyone who has joined us this uh, beautiful afternoon. Um, it is such a pleasure to be joining you for Being Me's Ramadan Revival. A very deep and sincere thank you to the whole Being Me team for putting all of this together and creating this space for us to share, reflect, and prepare for what I pray will be a very memorable and impactful Ramadan, uh, God willing. So I'm here in Ottawa on the unceded, never surrendered Algonquin territory. Uh, many of you actually will be familiar with these types of land recognitions and acknowledgements. Uh, you may have heard of them before, you know, you've attended events um, or you're, you know, listening to something on the radio and they mention land recognition, etc. And I actually thought it might be a good place to start our conversation today. And why so? Well, Ramadan is a time, of course, of spiritual renewal, but also of awakening. And this renewal and awakening uh, hopefully leads to placing empathy at the center of everything that we do. So empathy is about being able to understand and share the feelings of another. And so oftentimes when we're explaining, you know, why do we fast Ramadan, many of us will point to the point uh, that this is an opportunity to imagine what it is like if you don't have access to food, if you are food insecure, um, if you do have to feel what it's actually like uh, to go hungry. And I pray, of course, that nobody in the world experiences that. It's a horrible feeling. And we're very fortunate that in Ramadan, we are able to break our fast. And so just that act alone of fasting is meant to help us build empathy. And so that type of empathy is really being about being conscious um, about everything and everyone around us to be in a state of awakening and a state of awareness. And so that's why it's actually so important that we recognize uh, on whose land we are, or we are sitting, even while in quarantine. Um, because, you know, the heartbreaking reality is that while, you know, I am safe and secure by God's grace in my own home on this land, uh, I hope that you are as well. Um, the reality is that many First Nations communities are, as we speak, facing incredible challenges challenges that existed before the coronavirus pandemic and now have become even more exacerbated by it. So in fact, just the other day, um, the, uh, the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Perry Bellegard, wrote in the Globe and Mail, quote, in many First Nations, potable water is intermittent at best and clean running water is a luxury. Timely access to healthcare is simply not a reality. Complicating this, First Nations also have higher incidences of heart disease, tuberculosis, diabetes, and chronic lung problems brought on by living in moldy and unsafe housing. So indeed, from China to Europe to the United States, he writes, one fact is becoming clearer by the day. Inequality is a comorbidity and often determines who lives and who dies. This pandemic exacerbates the already dire circumstances in which too many First Nations peoples live. Now you may be wondering, why am I talking about this in a session about Ramadan revival? Well, you've already heard from incredible speakers who have been talking to you this afternoon about how we can improve our own characters, how we can increase our worship, how we can use Ramadan as a springboard for the rest of the year, and all of that is so valuable. And all of those crucial acts are really at the core about being a better human being. And that must equate for all of us to be able to stand up against injustice in our own communities and actively engage to put an end to those types of injustices. So for instance, to be able to empathize with the First Nations the Indigenous peoples who our creator placed on this land long before any settler arrived here is a key example of how we raise our own consciousness. 
as first, second, or third generation Canadians or as newly arrived immigrants and refugees to Canada, we must recognize the original caretakers of this land who were for thousands of years here before Canada came to be and who have undergone incredible forms of oppression that continue sadly to this day. When I recognize that these lands here in Ottawa are unceded Algonquin territories belonging to the Algonquin tribe, um, and they never gave up the right to this land in any negotiation with those who came to settle it, then I am able to acknowledge the truth of my existence here. And our faith is all about truth telling. By uniting with our indigenous brothers and sisters, by hearing their stories and sharing their experiences and pledging solidarity with those who demand their rights, we begin to build empathy. And so sort of, I, I would say that we're on a journey and many people have talked about being on a journey in Ramadan or any other time, a journey towards, you know, coming closer to our creator, to live a life um, that is pleasing to our creator, that is based on mercy and love. So here are three key markers um, on our journey towards empathy and towards success in this world and hopefully success in the hereafter. And as you think about these three markers, I think you'll be able to apply them to almost any scenario that you come across in your life. And I call them roadside markers for the journey. Um, so as we are reflecting and learning throughout the month of Ramadan, as we are seeking to revive our hearts um, and seeking you know, to focus on ourselves, I also hope that we can look around ourselves and try to focus on also what's happening around us. You know, not only do we need to take ourselves to account for our own personal actions at home with our loved ones on our spiritual development, but we also have to think about how do we fully implement Islam as a positive empowering force in our communities. So the first roadside marker on our journey is simply gaining awareness. And I'll explain each of these as I go. The second roadside marker is checking our own privilege. And the third is uniting for positive change. So awareness. Staying for a moment on the example of the Indigenous experiences in Canada, I myself only started to learn about Indigenous experiences in this country a few years ago when I was actually working to defend and promote the rights and freedoms of Canadian Muslims. Until then, I did not know the extent of, the, of how those who came to this land over 150 years ago had contributed to what the former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada called a cultural genocide. That thousands upon thousands of children had been taken from their families in order to quote, civilize them, so that they would no longer speak their own beautiful languages or practice their own beautiful spirituality, or that they would any longer know how to survive and thrive off the lands that they had lived on for generations. So, that first roadside marker, I became aware. Then as the awareness was growing and I was hearing more and more people describing not only the historic wrongs, but how these past injustices continue to take place, that a huge number of indigenous children are still taken from their families who are struggling to support them and, into, and put into foster homes, that until now, far too many reserves, as you just heard earlier, don't have clean drinking water. This is in Canada we're talking about. They don't have adequate schools, etc. All of this. Then that second roadside marker, I started to understand my own privilege in having those things and taking them often for granted. Yes, I was working on human rights issues at the time for Muslims in Canada, talking about how we had to preserve our own rights to practice our religion. But even while discussing the challenges we were facing as Canadian Muslims, I realized that I had to check that privilege still because I had benefited from a system that had taken away the religious rights and freedoms of indigenous communities along with other rights, that in fact, the very concept of multiculturalism that we often celebrate that you know had really given my family and many of our families and our communities a chance to thrive in Canada was in fact based on indigenous teachings that had been completely ignored in relation to how their very communities were being treated so the the irony and sadly almost hypocrisy of welcoming immigrants to Canada while oppressing the first peoples of this land you know had had previously just gone beyond me and I hadn't even realized it. 
So I started to check my privilege. And then that third, uh, you know, getting to the third of gaining awareness and then understanding privilege. Third is uniting for change. You know, I, I've been fortunate to have the opportunity to speak to many audiences, to encourage people to learn more about the human rights abuses and violations that have been perpetuated against First Nation, Indigenous, Métis, Inuit people. And I've listened and I've shared the message of many Indigenous advocates, people like Cindy Blackstock, and I really encourage you to look up these folks, look up these issues, who've been fighting to win adequate support for children's health and education so that Indigenous children receive equal funding as all other children in Canada. And I've seen many local and Muslim, national and Muslim organizations actually unite with indigenous communities, right? So the uniting for change has been happening in our communities, building unity in order to work together to achieve justice. And that's been happening just in the past few years alone, but it has been so inspiring to see that uniting for change. Now, I, I was doing a little promotion for this Being Me event last night, and, and I referenced a beautiful prophetic tradition from uh, one of our uh, books, Sahih Muslim, and essentially it's whoever relieves the hardship of someone in this world, God relieves from them a hardship on the day of judgment. And, you know, there's so many other examples of prophetic traditions and verses in the Holy Quran that talk about the importance of helping each other, standing with each other. I think it's, it's just so beautiful to recognize that as you help others, the creator will also be helping you. And, and so, of course, it's, it's this beautiful cycle that, you know, to help and pay it forward, as it's called, and to continuously having this beautiful giving that occurs that, that we've seen in the course of this pandemic. You know, we've seen those who are hoarding toilet paper, and we've seen those who started caremongering groups. You know, where do you want to be? Um, so this is, you know, this is just one of the examples from our tradition that really emphasizes that critical importance of service, of helping others. And not only do we want to embody the values of our tradition that emphasize mercy, kindness, and compassion, we want to make sure that we are constantly aware of what's happening and checking that privilege and uniting for change. And not only is that helping others, but actually, you know, and studies have shown this, we wind up helping ourselves. That when you volunteer or when you stand up for someone or you help someone, that in fact, you're actually improving your own mental health and well-being. You're actually improving the way that you and your family feel if you do it together as a family, if you unite for change, even within your own family and demonstrate that kind of example for your children. What a powerful way uh, to make a difference. And even now in a time of this pandemic where many of us are forced to stay close to home, unable to go out as we once did, there are still so many ways that we can still help our communities. And when I talk about communities, I'm talking about broader communities, not only our own communities, our Muslim communities, but right across humanity. And that is, you know, the responsibility that we have um, as, you know, servants of God. Now, it's actually been really uplifting to see how Canadian Muslims have actually stepped up uh, by coordinating vo volunteer efforts in their local communities to support all vulnerable and elderly people in this pandemic. You know, I've seen, uh, you know, there's so many organizations, I, I, I would probably take up my whole time to name them all, but, you know, groups like the Muslim Medical Association of Canada, the Canadian Council of Imams, um, you know, they've joined forces, they've created something called the Muslim COVID-19 Task Force with incredible leadership from community leaders. You know, here in my hometown, I've seen the United Muslim Organizations of Ottawa Gatineau, you know, collaboration of 13 mosques, working with Human Concern International, Islamic Relief, the Carleton University and University of Ottawa Muslim Student Associations, and the Muslim Family Services of Ottawa, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, all of these groups coming together and they're serving broadly uh, society and helping people cope with the effects of COVID-19. Now, these groups are, are comprised, you know, not of superheroes. They don't have capes. They're not flying around. They don't have special immunity to COVID-19. They're just as risk as, as, as any of us. But they're, they're just people who want to volunteer in a, in a way that fully demonstrates why God tells us to be united, to stand together, to work in coordination for the greater good. And you know what? my dear sisters and, and any brothers who are out there and curious about what women do when they talk amongst themselves, um, we can continue to do so much more during this pandemic and after, God willing, it's all over, to stand up for those who are less fortunate than ourselves in our communities. 
This pandemic, as many people have pointed out, has laid bare how unequal our communities are. Wherever you look, whatever story pops up on your social media feed or in your news alerts, there is one more group in our society that seems to especially be hurting by what's going on right now. Um, and while I know it can sometimes be hard to get out of our own heads, you know, I get it. Sometimes I just want to go back to bed and sleep all of this off and wait till it's over. Or, you know, if I've managed to feed my kids three healthy meals in the day, like I feel I've, I've achieved some, some great achievement. That's totally okay to feel overwhelmed right now. Yet, I do want to encourage myself first and foremost, but all of us to push further for the sake of our creator. Um, when we push ourselves to learn about our neighbors, about the vulnerable in our communities, when we push ourselves to, you know, those markers, gain awareness, check our privilege, unite for change, we can really achieve so much more than we, we've even imagined. So let's, for a moment, if I may, just take some time to think about the lessons that this pandemic has already provided us with, and there are many. Um, and I won't enumerate them all, but a few key lessons when we're thinking about social justice and our role in standing up for social justice in our communities. Number one, we cannot turn a blind eye to the reality that far too many people in our communities are food insecure. They do not have adequate access to food for themselves, for their children, or that many people do not have adequate shelter or that many people are just barely surviving, living paycheck to paycheck. Social inequalities are honestly a huge failure on the part of our governments, governments that we have elected to help people fulfill their potential. And I was listening the other day to Malcolm Gladwell, who's one of my favorite authors talking about this. And he pointed out what many have pointed out before, but I think it's really resonant right now is that we are only as strong as our weakest link. You know, we have to take that to heart um, because this, this concept that we're only as strong as our weakest link and therefore if we want to get ahead in this world, if we want to you know, have a wonderful future for our children, we have to make sure that no one is left behind. And this concept of you know, caring for your brother or sister as much as you would care for yourself, you know, loving for your brother or sister what you would love for yourself. This is deeply entrenched in Islamic tradition, but in all faith traditions, in all simple ideals of what, what humanity should be about. We must take care of each other. It sounds so obvious, but the truth is, this is not how society is structured at the moment. And this is a huge, again, failure. And so I commit myself, and I encourage us all to commit, to really thinking about how do we implement change to make sure that now and in the future, no one is left behind in our society. Everyone has a decent chance at having a decent life that is free of anxiety, free of worry about tomorrow, where they know where their food uh, is going to come from, where they are secure that they'll be able to feed their children. Lesson number two, even the most humble job in our society is of huge value and importance to the well-being and success of our entire society. So whether a person is a doctor in a hospital and, and deservedly they are heroes, but so are the cleaners who work so hard, um, whether in that hospital, hospital or in a long-term care facility, each of those individuals who are working hard are of immense importance to make sure that we are all safe, that our loved ones are taken care of. Yet the reality is we have to ask, why are some workers treated so poorly? And frankly, have we really been standing up for workers who are barely making a decent living wage? Do we even think about how other people may be struggling to survive working one to two to three jobs and still barely able to put food on the table? People are doing their best to have an honest living. And yet society, up until now at least, thought it was okay to pay them barely anything. You know, not to guarantee them sick paid leave if they get sick, that they don't worry about losing their job, you know, that they don't have benefits, that they're struggling. How is it okay that, that people thought it was all right to barely pay these folks anything? 
and certainly they've been struggling and many, many studies show this and often it's racialized and, and, and female workers who are most uh, you know, vulnerable in these situations, they can barely keep up with the cost of living as it goes up, but their wages stay the same. So are we aware of this? Have we checked our privilege around this stuff? You know, are we ourselves maybe in that situation? Maybe you're listening to me right now and you're like, that's actually me, that's my situation and I haven't been able to talk about this with anyone because there may be some shame attached to this that maybe, you know, I have to do this type of work, I'm a single mother, I am struggling to get by and I'm, I'm having difficulty, but I don't know who to turn to. I don't know who to talk to. I'm afraid to go to the local food bank. I don't want anyone to know. No, there sh should not be shame. The shame is on those of us who have the privilege and the ability to stand up and make sure that, again, every single person in our society is treated fairly, that they have the tools they need to, to get ahead just as anyone else, and that if something is broken in our system, that we need to come collectively and figure out how to fix that problem. And lesson number three, those who are caught up in our justice system, those who are in our prisons, and, and, and you know, there are those who are even simply migrants to Canada who've done nothing wrong and they're held in detention centers. All of these human beings, we've been hearing about them lately, are at more risk of COVID-19. So now we're thinking a little bit more, oh, what are the conditions in these prisons? How are people treated? What about the corrections officers who work there? Does everyone have what they need? Do we think about these folks? They're often marginalized. They're not really considered in a lot of public policy. Maybe no one wants to think about them. But is this justice? Is this fairness? And especially when we think about that the, there are a disproportionate number of people of color and indigenous folks who are in those prisons. You know, and I was just watching a video about something called the, the Circle of Compassion, a program in the US that is studying uh, prison populations and discovering that a vast majority of those in prisons have had horrific trauma traumatic experiences as children. They're not there because they wanted to get involved in criminal activity. They're there because, again, they did not have the opportunities that many of us have. They grew up in difficult circumstances and society wasn't there for them. And so we have to, again, think about how are we standing up for those folks? How are we making sure to, to stop you know, the school to prison pipeline that unfortunately still impacts many people of color and especially young men of color? What are we thinking about? What are we doing? Are we, again, raising our awareness on these types of issues? Many of whom, of course, have mental health struggles. You know, Our mental health supports are inadequate in our country. And again, what are we doing about this? How are we raising these issues? who visits these folks in the prisons. I know some you know, mosques or programming in our communities does have efforts to go and meet inmates and provide them the support, and that's fantastic. Can we participate in something like this as women? There are, are female inmates, for instance. So again, I'm just trying, my sisters, to share some of these thoughts with you as a way to highlight the many, many issues surrounding us that we must be aware of um, that we must check our privilege on and that we must unite around. Now, before you kind of maybe feel a teeny bit overwhelmed by all of this, I just want to say I am not expecting all of us to become social justice warriors overnight or tackle any of this tomorrow. Of course not. Um, what I am saying is that as we prepare to enter Ramadan, to revive our hearts, um, I hope that we all think hard about how are we helping to support those around us? How are we making or supporting positive change in our own communities? Um, and if I may, a quick, quick pop cultural reference for those of you who sometimes watch movies and maybe some of us are watching a bit more movies lately than, than we'd like to. Um, I'm sure a few of you have either read The Hunger Games or seen the films. And of course, a quick recap for those who haven't or who forgot, The Hunger Games is about how super wealthy people living in what's called the capital get to choose a few young people from different districts surrounding them to play to the death while everyone else watches. The protagonist, Katniss Everdeen, sacri sacrifices herself by volunteering to be a tribute instead of her sister. She manages to win repeatedly and in the process helps lead a revolution against the unjust leaders of the capital. Now take a step back and let's think about the message of the movie in the book. 
When we see how the majority of people are living in these districts, many of those districts are poor. Many of them are there simply to produce resources or farm food to send back to the capital, capital while they themselves have very little. How do we feel by that when we see that? Is it fair? Do we feel empathy for the people who you know, are barely subsisting on, on what they are producing but have to send most of it to the capital? Now, and when you look at the capital, most of the people are preoccupied with parties or fashion. They have abundant food and luxury. Do we have more empathy for those folks or for the people who are toiling? Now, I'm certain most of us would be on the side of the poor and vulnerable and disenfranchised, but think for a moment. Many of us who live in Western countries get to live off the resources and the labor of other less fortunate people around the world, even now in this pandemic. So when this webinar is done, for instance, just look at the labels of your clothing. Where were they made? In Canada, where there are fair labor standards and, well, minimum wages, even though they're still not that fair, or in Vietnam or Bangladesh or Indonesia or some other country that pays its workers very little while they work in subpar conditions. In Bangladesh a few years ago, over 1,000 workers were killed when a factory where they were making clothing for Western companies for our consumption collapsed. So as I conclude and come to that conclusion, I just want to go back to that roadmap and those roadside markers we need in order to build empathy and unity on our journey. Number one, awareness. Many of us don't realize this, but we are among the world's 1% richest people. There's a website called www.globalrichlist.com and you can see how you compare. Number two, once we are aware of how most of the world's population is living in challenging circumstances, either out of Canada or even in our own country, st struggling to afford basic necessities like food or sending their children to school or simply waking up without the fear of war and destructions, destruction, we then realize our own immense privilege, the privilege of having so much more, not only in material wealth, but in freedom, in safety and in security, in being able to stay safe in our homes right now, without fearing that a bomb may fall nearby or worrying that the factory where we would hope to go back to work to or the, the company will collapse on top of us. And three, to do what we're doing right now, uniting for change. We find like-minded people who care about the issues that we wanna work on, one issue, two issues, whatever you can handle. And we all work together on those issues. We unite to look for ways to improve the lives of those who have few opportunities. We look for both financial and political avenues. We have to learn to engage more in politics so that we can push for more fair public policies. We can therefore unite for the betterment of our communities locally and globally. So this is a roadmap that I hope we can try to follow. One where gaining awareness, checking privilege and uniting for change are constant, constant markers on the journey. And I sincerely, sincerely hope and pray and believe that with these in mind, we will ultimately reach the best destination of all, save our families and hopefully earn God's pleasure, God willing. So thank you so much for giving me some of your time and listening to me today. And I hope whatever I've said has been useful and whatever is good is from the creator, the most merciful, and whatever is not so great is just from me. So thank you so much. I mean, Jazakumullah, um, Sister Amira, uh, SubhanAllah, you're, you're definitely bumping up the social justice causes on my list to the top. Um, I, I really want to get into more of that, as you say, social justice warrior, inshallah. And uh, you, know, you just, you just helped us to revive that. And I'm so thankful for you in terms of sharing that roadmap with us. Uh, definitely, you know, these are uh, issues and details that a lot turn a deaf ear and, uh, you know, we're unaware and unable to make that difference. And you said something really prominent, which we'll talk about in the next few seconds with the next MC that's going to come up. But Jazakum Allah Haran, reward you and your family. And inshallah, we look forward to hosting you again. Um, I think we have someone else is going to be 